A farmer is working in the fields when all the sheep suddenly escape from their pen. They're scattering everywhere, far and wide. Surely the wolves are lurking nearby, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. One farmer can't possibly gather all those sheep, even on horseback. But one dog can. No, not a dog on horseback. The dog could outrun the sheep and herd them in. Dogs were domesticated between 14,000 and 29,000 years ago. Their initial purpose? To help us humans with day-to-day tasks we couldn't do ourselves. Eventually, we discovered that dogs of different sizes and skills can do certain jobs better. A German Shepherd would help, well, shepherds in Germany. Dobermans were used for security, since they come off as intimidating tough cookies. Or take other breeds, like terriers. They were bred to sniff out rats and other vermin in hard-to-reach places. Dogs were the original pest control before there was a 1-800 number you could call in a snap. Hey, thanks, Fido! Greyhounds are slick-looking racers and were bred for hunting. They could chase game up to 45 miles per hour, making them the fastest dog breed in the world. Good luck keeping this dog in an apartment! Mastiffs have been around since ancient Roman times. They were used to fend off lions and other large animals, making them the perfect watchdog for protection. They may seem vicious and scary, but they're actually gentle giants that love playing and lounging around. The St. Bernard is a big fluffy dog that can withstand frigid temperatures. They're used to locate lost mountain climbers and travelers stuck in snowstorms or avalanches. They're also known as the best couriers in the dog world and can pull a cart on their own. If you live in an icy land all year round, chances are you'd have a couple Siberian huskies on your side. They're helpful for transportation and do well in a group. The people who live in such conditions use these dogs to pull their sleds from one place to another to this day. But then, you get some really, uh, let's say, unique-looking but still adorable doggos. I'm looking at you, Bull Terrier! These smooth-snouted canines are known to be pretty tough in the dog world. They thrive on human companionship and can't get enough playtime. Ah, and then there's Pugs, our favorite bug-eye companions. Pugs have been around for hundreds of years in China as the perfect lap dogs. They're also known to be the clowns of the dog world. They were eventually introduced to Europe and went global from there. They became so popular that they appeared in paintings as far back as the 1700s. One of the oldest dog breeds ever, and the only one with a blue tongue, is the Chow Chow. Chows might look intimidating, but as it usually goes, they're super lovable cuties. If you're a cat person, this breed just might convert you. Chows love their alone time and are often compared to cats that way. They may not be super keen on making friends, but they're incredibly loyal companions. Experts believe these walking teddy bears originally came from Mongolia in northern China. And after many years, they slowly began moving south with nomadic tribes as hunting dogs. Like pugs, illustration of chow chows appeared on pottery and in paintings as far back as 2,000 years ago. When their popularity reached the rest of the world, the chow chow name just stuck. One of the first wolf dogs were hybrids between wolves and Pomeranians. Yup, those cute little accessory pooches are part wolf. But the Pomeranians of the 18th century were nothing like the ones today. They were tough, muscular working dogs that used to help shepherds with livestock and even plowing the field in snowy conditions. Terriers, greyhounds, mastiffs, pugs… Imagine any type of dog, and you'll see tons of variety. All those different canine shapes and breeds resulted from thousands of years of living with humans. Through selective breeding, dogs could be sort of customized over generations. You could call them GMOs, genetically modified organisms, but they did it the long way. You could make them taller, more muscular, with longer or shorter snouts. The list is endless, depending on the job. The environment also plays a role in canine evolution. One fossil study of ancient dogs in North America found that their bone structure changed with a cooling climate. They went from ambush pouncers in the jungle, sort of like cats, to long-distance runners chasing down their meal. In the end, we come to 190 recognized dog breeds in the US alone. The same can't be said about cats, which is only 42 breeds officially. Ah, the mysterious cat. So vicious in the cutest way possible. One second it's purring and brushing up against your leg. The next, it's going straight for your hand, claws ablaze, because you pet Mr. Whiskers in the wrong spot. Yeah. Cats were domesticated roughly 10,000 years ago, but in typical independent cat fashion. They kind of domesticated themselves. They'd hang out near human settlements and hunt mice on farms. We humans like that. So we decided to take these cute little animals with us everywhere. 
Fast forward to today, and now we've got the perfect pet. You don't have to take them outside to go to the bathroom. They groom and entertain themselves. They even plot against you when you're sleeping. At least, I'm almost positive my cat does that. Dogs come in so many shapes and sizes. Many breeds don't even look like they're the same species of animal. With cats, you get some variety in size and coat patterns, but that's about it. The largest breed is the Maine Coon, which can weigh up to 20 pounds of pure fluff. These large kitties most likely came to North America on ships. Their job was to keep the mice population down during the journey. The Sphinx looks something like from a sci-fi movie or an ancient cat that's been around for centuries. I mean, the great Sphinx of Giza. Surely there's a connection. Nah, this hairless kitty has only been around since the 60s, and it was bred in Canada of all places. The Japanese bobtail looks like a mix between a cat and a rabbit. Their nubby little palm tail resembles a bunny's, and they even hop a little when running. That's because their hind legs are a bit longer than their front ones. They had a big job to do at first. History records suggest these cats were used to get rid of rodents that were causing a major problem for Japan's silk trade in the 1600s. The savannah looks like a cat you'd find in the jungles or rainforest, and you'd be half right. This kitty is a mix between a domestic cat and the serval, an actual wild African cat. These pointy-eared beauties are the tallest domestic cat breed and have unique cheetah-like spots. Actually, there are people out there who keep servals as pets. They're larger than any typical house cat and can cause a ruckus if they're cooped up in a closed environment for too long. It's not recommended to have one of these at home, since they're known for severely clawing couches and sofas. And you may want to pack up your curtains too, and pillows, and anything else. Ocelots are one of the most striking wild cats out there. You could easily compare them to servals, since they rock those stripy waves and love clawing around. They can get as big as German Shepherds and come in many colors and patterns. But what makes ocelots strike out the most are their pointy ears and bushy beard. That and Salvador Dali famously kept one as a pet. Now, if I show you a jaguar and a leopard side by side, could you tell the difference? Here's a cheat sheet. Look closer at the spots. They both have those distinct black rosettes, but jaguars have little dots inside theirs. Leopards have no tiny dots in their spots. Also, just ask where each animal is from. Jaguars live in Central and South America. You'll only find leopards in Africa and parts of Asia. And to differentiate between a wild cat and a domesticated one, you'll need to look closer. Closer. Even more. That's it. Genes. Thanks to those, house cats have more control over their wild aggressive behavior. They're also better at creating memories. Over time, these genes were passed down from kitty to kitty until we were so fortunately gifted with the standard house cat. Wild cats also seem to have larger brains relative to their size and don't quite purr. Yeah, we all love a nice purr, but tell that to a lion. Lion and other wild cats usually vocalize by, yeah, roaring. This is because of the different throat structures in both felines. And a fun cat fact for the day. Cheetahs are the only cats, both big and small, that can't retract their claws. It's even in their scientific name. The genus Asaconix means no-move claw in Greek. And finally, it's time for no more talk from me. See ya! So, we all know that Mother Nature is wise. If she blesses some creature with a particular body part, it should make perfect sense, right? Well, yeah, but still, some wildlife shots make you wonder if evolution has gone the wrong way. Snakes' natural design allows them to swallow a whole mouse. But in some cases, this cool ability can turn against them. Yes, snakes can actually swallow themselves. Scientists believe that they mostly do this because of stress, captivity, temperature regulation, hunger, or illness. The snake is pretty helpless in this situation, you can tell. If it doesn't get help in time, digestive juices may begin to corrode the swallow tail. So if you ever catch your pet snake doing this, try to stop it or take it to the vet. Okay, but what about the fangs, I hear you ask? Does a venomous snake have immunity to its own venom? Well, if the snake digests it, it will be okay. It's because protein is a primary component in venom. And besides, the venom is excreted by the gland in the snake's mouth. So no matter whom the snake bites, chances are that it's going to drink a bit. So the only way a snake can actually suffer from its own venom is by biting itself straight into the blood vessel. 
In this case, it'll experience the same reaction as any other animal. Now, think you're having a bad hair day? Hey, check this guy out. Chris was an Australian merino ram who became a celebrity in 2015 after being discovered in the wild. Farmers shorn him and gained nearly 90 pounds of wool. When the animal was found, he carried over five years' worth of fleece on his body. But Chris belonged to the domestic sheep breed that needs to be shorn regularly. Otherwise, the animal is at great risk of injury and infection. So the lives of these cuties depend directly on going to the hairdresser. Shall we talk about horns? Cattle, goats, and many other species proudly wear this fancy headdress not only for fashion, but also as a weapon for brutal battles. If you ask this bighorn sheep ram directly how old he is, you'll probably hear something like, bah. But if you want to get a more precise answer, you can count the number of rings on his horns. The biggest and the darkest ring usually marks the fourth birthday, when the ram matures enough for mating. Although animal horns may look very tough, in fact, most of them are made of keratin. It's the same protein that builds human hair and nails. Horns never stop growing as the animal ages, just like our own hair. And eventually, they can curl into really extravagant shapes, making these weapons turn against their owners. This is what a Wilshire sheep horn looks like when it's young. But as the years go by, the horns typically curl in front of its face. And while most grow out harmlessly, the inward-growing horns can end up dangerously close to the sheep's head. Like this ram who's having bad luck, to say the least. Its horn has slowly grown into its own skull, and eventually, well, it didn't end well for the sheep. Of course, this would hardly have happened on a farm, because people would have made a preventive horn cut. But unfortunately, in the wild, animals cannot use hairdresser services. That's why they use rocks and branches to rub and grind away at their horns to keep them safe, just like humans trim their nails. Faulty genetics is not the only reason for the horn distortion. You see, when males of this species want to fight for dominance, they begin to butt heads to show each other who's the alpha male here. Mm -hmm. These battles can break horn plates, making them grow at weird and dangerous angles. The fancier the original shape of the horns is, the more problems their fracture may cause. This poor African kudu is a bright example. Fortunately, in some cases, unlimited body part growth can be good for the animal. Just take a look at these adorable smiles. If you happen to break off your own molar tooth, your dentist would probably say it's irreversible and offer a replacement. But if an alpaca breaks its front teeth, all it has to do is wait a bit. Although these animals don't have upper teeth, their lower teeth constantly grow throughout their lifetime. And they might look pretty creepy when they get too long. That's why some farmers prefer trimming them from time to time. Just like pet owners cut the nails of their cats or dogs. Now llamas look so similar to alpacas that many people confuse these two species. But the significant difference between them is that llamas' front teeth are encased in enamel. That's why, unlike alpacas, they don't possess the superpower of limited growth. Eh, too bad. Unlike the keratin horns, deer antlers are made entirely of bone. Typically, only male deers, called stags, grow antlers. Very rarely, females can grow them too due to a serious hormone imbalance. This is a deer equivalent of a beard on a human female that sometimes can appear due to various diseases. Adult deers grow and shed their antlers annually, which coincides with the breeding season. At first, their antlers are covered in velvet, a protective skin with blood vessels. But once the antler is fully developed, the deer gets rid of the velvet, just like snakes shed their skin. Although this process doesn't harm the deer, it may look pretty spooky. Once the brand new antlers are ready, stags begin to fight with other males over the ladies' attention. Usually stags barely eat or sleep during this competition. And if you ever question whether the antlers of two deers can get locked together, the answer is yes. Every stag is risking ending up stuck with his own rival instead of having a romantic night out with a female deer. Bummer. Moreover, all the traumas that the deer gets during the mating season can influence further antler growth if specific nerves get damaged. 
Just like horns, antlers can develop at distorted angles because of genetic failures. Some mutations can even make them grow monstrously large. This unlucky deer can barely move his head without losing balance. Also, if a deer breaks one of its legs, its body can speed up the healing by sacrificing the bone and blood material from one of the antlers. And thus, this antler will get thinner and weaker. And speaking of facial extensions, we cannot skip the tusks. Please meet Babarusa from Indonesia. This ancient boar first emerged over 35,000 years ago. It's easy to confuse these big tusks with horns, but they are actually upper canines. They tend to pierce through the skin of the boar's face as it matures. Scientists believe that these intimidating tusks have evolved as a tool to protect eyes and throat while fighting with other males during mating season. But this design doesn't seem very thoughtful. If a male boar doesn't grind his tusk regularly, they can end up curling back into his own skull, which can blind him or even worse. Now, what if I told you that hoofs can grow out of control just like horns and antlers? It took evolution millions of years to turn the middle toe of the animal's foot bone into the hoof. And just like toenails, they tend to grow and curl into creepy shapes if they aren't cut regularly. When donkeys or horses don't have a chance to wear down their hooves naturally by walking on hard surfaces, they tend to overgrow. This makes the animals walk on the balls of their feet and overstretch the tendons, which may result in pain and bone loss. And eventually, they can lose the ability to walk at all. So if you ever come across a horse with curly hooves, consider calling the experts to give it an emergency manicure. Perhaps one of the most obvious questions regarding the undersea world is, can a fish drown in the water? Yup, it can. Although gills are an amazing gift of nature, there are still many factors that may deprive a fish of healthy breathing. When the oxygen level in the water is too low, fish begin to suffocate. But it happens very rarely in the wild. Oxygen deficit usually appears in aquariums that are not washed and replenished often enough. Also, parasites, diseases, and an overall imbalance in water components can cause the fish to drown. And on that note, I need to hoof it on out of here. See you next time! That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.